First Chronicles chapter number 11. Talk about one of my favorite heroes in the Bible. First Chronicles chapter 11. Just going to read a couple verses and glean a thought from these verses. Begin reading verse 22. The Bible says, Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man of Kabzeel, who had done many acts, he slew two lion-like men of Moab. Also he went down and slew a lion in a pit in a snowy day. And he slew an Egyptian, a man of great stature, five cubits high. That's seven and a half feet tall. Hmm? And in the Egyptian's hand was a spear like a weaver's beam. And he went down to him with a staff and plucked the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and slew him with his own spear. These things did Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and had the name among, among the three mighties. Behold, he was honorable among the thirty, but attained not to the first three, and David set him over his guard. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you for the good singing. Thank you for being a good God, a present help in time of need. Thank you, Lord, for being so much better to us than we ever deserve. Lord, so much better to us than we've ever been for you. Now, Father, bless now. Help these thy people. Lord, there's no telling what they have faced, what they are facing, and what they will be facing. But, Lord, if they know you, we know they'll never face it alone. So I pray you'd help us tonight. Use this unworthy vessel. Glorify your name, and we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Uh, Benaiah is one of David's most mighty men. And David set him over his guard. Uh, Benaiah is Rambo on crack. Uh, Rambo on steroids ten times over. Uh, Rambo had machine guns and all kinds of stuff, and all we find Benaiah had was a staff. And yet he did valiant and mighty works. And we find that this man loved his king, he loved God, and he loved his nation. And we find this man did some great things. But I want you to notice some things in these verses. I want you to notice, first of all, the pictorial truth. The pictorial truth. We see uh, in these verses some pictures of things. The first thing we see is uh, Benaiah himself, his name means God builds. We see he's the son of Jehoiada, and his name means God knows. Can I say before ever God does something, God already knows. And that's important for you and I, because if God is ever impressed upon you to do anything for him... God already knows. He knows what you're able to do, what you're not able to do. You may try to talk him out of it. You may try to tell him you can't do it. Uh, but if God's asked you to do it, he's already equipped you to get the job done. huh? But then we find that uh, uh, Jehoiada is the son of a valiant man of Kabzeel. Kabzeel means God has gathered. There was a place that God gathered these men in order to produce a man named Benaiah that was going to do something for the honor and glory of God. I'm glad God's got a place that he's gathered us together uh, uh, where he equips us uh, so we can go and do some things for him. Now, in the pictorial truths of these uh, uh, wonderful verses that we read, we find that Benaiah slew two lion-like men of Moab. Uh, lion-like, they were ferocious. These men uh, of the Middle East, I don't know if you've ever dealt with men of the Middle East, uh, uh, but they only know one thing, and that is violence. Uh, and he f had to face not only men who know violence, but these were lion-like men, men who were not going to quit, uh, men who had to be taken down, uh, and uh, Benaiah was the man for the job. Uh, he slew two of them, uh, and Moab is always a picture of the flesh. Uh, and can I say, my dear friends, uh, uh, your flesh is not saved. Uh, and some days you have no problem putting your flesh down. Uh, but there are other days when your flesh will rise up uh, and be lion-like uh, and won't give up easily. Uh, no wonder 
wonder the great apostle, Apostle Paul said he had to die daily. Uh, 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 you have to constantly slay your flesh in order to be the spiritual person God would have you to be. We see not only uh, 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 the pictorial truth of these lion-like men, uh, but we also see that he went down and he slew a lion in a pit uh, in a snowy day. Uh, uh, the lion's always a picture of the devil. Uh, be sober, be vigilant. Uh, uh, your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Uh, uh, we see that he defeated a lion. Uh, 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 what a man who take on a lion. Most people uh, run from lions. He ran toward the lion and whipped a lion in a pit uh, on a snowy day. Uh, uh, so we see uh, uh, the pictorial truth uh, uh, that he overcame the flesh. Uh, uh, he overcame the devil. Uh, then he slew this tall Egyptian man. Uh, uh, and, and Egypt's always a picture of the world. Uh, and he overcame the world. Uh, and this uh, uh, Egyptian had a, uh, had a, a sword, a spear, uh, uh, the size of a weaver's beam. Uh, uh, and that's all the world's intellect, all the world's logic, all the world's world uh, will throw at you my dear friends and he defeated him with a staff and a staff's a picture of the word of God uh, so he overcame the, the world the flesh and the devil and that's the pictorial truths of these verses can I say there's not only that there's the physical truth he literally whipped two lion like men of Moab he literally whipped a lion he literally whipped this tall Egyptian man there's the physical truth and then there's the practical truth. The pictorial truth and the physical truth shows us that we can ascertain from these things that God has equipped us to handle anything that comes against us. We can overcome and we can be victorious in the Lord. I'm interested there at the end of verse 22 where he says, Also he went down and slew a lion in a pit in a snowy day. It's one thing to have to face a lion, I guess. You remember that little African missionary we had last year came up with Brother Stewart and Brother Emmanuel Charles, and he kept trying to get me to come to Africa, and he's talking about sleeping out there and lions walking by, sleeping out in the open air, and lions walking out, and snakes falling out of trees and hitting people, knocking them out and swallowing them up. And all that kind of, I said, Brother, you can have it. Said, God called you there, not me. Oh, come, you'll be safe. No, I'm safe right here. Mm. No lions running around the streets of Florence, huh? But it'd be one thing to have to face a lion if you was accustomed to facing lions. But he's in a pit. He's in a pit. He can't run away if he wants to. He's in a pit and he slays the lion. And this is a thought. The Lord gave me this thought, and I, I, I really wasn't going to preach on Benaiah, but the Lord gave me a thought, and I couldn't get away from the thought, but I want to preach on this thought. A pit don't have to become a pitfall. A pit don't have to become a pitfall. Let me give you this. Holy Ghost gave me this. Your pit may define you, but your pit doesn't have to defeat you. Your pit may define you. We know Benea because he slew a lion in a pit. It defined him, but it didn't defeat him. Amen. You're liable to end up a pit, in a pit someday. Hmm? Can I say the sorry no good devil lays snares out there? And have you seen in them old movies, they dig a pit and put some leaves over it and people come walking through and fall in the pit. And the devil may have a snare out there for you to fall into. Amen. Can I say, sometimes just walking down the road, you'll step off and fall in a hole. Yeah. You ever turn your ankle? Yeah. Stepping off a curb and hit a hole? Huh? There's no fault of the devil. The devil wasn't the one who put that hole there. Just so happened you just happened to hit it. Hmm? Right. And can I say, sometimes we end up in pits that are our own making. Yeah. Amen. Hmm? But you may end up in a pit, may not be of your own making, may not even be the devil, just might be life itself. Hmm? I, want to, I want to tell you something. Miss Veronica didn't get in the line, give me Bell's palsy a couple weeks ago. She just ended up in a pit. Now, she could have let it become a pitfall. She could have said, well, I'm not going back to church. 
I'm not going to sing for Jesus anymore. I'm not going to raise these grandchildren to trust in Jesus. Uh, she could have let that be a pitfall. I mean, I'm sure it's difficult for her. Hmm? I'm sure it's hard for her, uh, wondering, oh, Lord, when are you going to touch me? When is this going to be over? Hmm? You may end up in a pit, but don't let your pit become a pitfall. Hmm? Don't let your defining moment end up in defeat. Hmm? So let me give you a few things about your pit. If you live long enough, you're going to end up in a pit. Hmm? Can I say, first of all, your pit will have elements. It said that he defeated, he slew a lion in a pit in a snowy day. That's bad enough, you're in a pit. Then you're looking at Leo the lion. I mean, but only to get worse, it's snowing. Now, friend... Now, I know we're not ready for it. I'm not ready. Anybody ready for winter? I'm not ready for winter. A couple of these chilly nights are reminding me, the older I get, these bones don't like the cold. But I do know something about being out in the cold. Your hands get stiff. They'll get numb. Your joints get stiff. You can't move like you... Even breathing in cold air will affect your lungs. He's in a pit. It's cold. How do you know it's cold, preacher? It's snowing. Huh? It's snowing. He's in a pit. It's cold. And even if he wanted to dig out, he couldn't dig himself out, couldn't crawl out, because his hands are stiff. Hmm? I've been out when it's cold and have gloves on and can't feel my fingers. He don't have gloves. The elements may affect your pit. There will be conditions out of your control when you hit the pit. Now, I would to God that we all had a red cape and we could just fly out of a pit. That's not the case. You will face some elements in your pit. Things that are out of your control. Things that uh, uh, are not pleasant. The conditions may not be pleasant in your pit. I want to tell you something. You get sick and go to the doctor and they start running a test on you, that's not pleasant. Hmm? I can't wait. Here in a couple of weeks, I've got to go back again. It's been four months since I've been. I can't wait. They're going to run that camera and thing right down my nose again. What a blessing that is. You say, well, what's the alternative? Well, I'll find out the cancer hadn't come back. What a blessing. But I just soon him pat me on the back and said, I don't think you got it. But well, it's not going to happen. Sometimes the conditions you have to face, and I didn't face anything compared to some of these ladies that had to go through chemo. Miss Mary and Miss Brandy and and and, and Miss uh, uh, Miss Brandy had surgery, and Miss Miss Crystal and all the things they've went through, and some of the things you all went through. And and let us just get this out in the open right now, ladies. None of us men know what it's like to give birth to a baby. Okay, we understand. Uh, don't want to know. I'll take your word for it. It's terrible. The travail. You can have it. All right? We just will that to women forever. Amen? Amen. But when you're in a pit and you have to face things and conditions and elements that you weren't expecting, it makes your pit worse than you would have ever dreamed. And let me just say this. Me standing up looking at you down in the pit... I have no right to judge or criticize or to offer you up any advice because that's your pit. Hmm? You know what I have learned in being at funeral homes quite often? People grieve differently. Hmm? There are some people, publicly, they seem like they got it all together and they grieve privately when nobody's around. There are some people who go all to pieces. There are some people that are joyful that they're not suffering anymore. People grieve differently. Amen. Can I say, people face their pits differently. Yeah. Amen. Hmm? Amen. Oh, it's one thing for me to stand back here and, and chuck stones at you because you're in a pit. But you're in a pit. And the elements and conditions of your pit will cause you to 
react different ways. There will be elements in your pit. There are things that you may not understand while you're in the pit. There are things that you may have no idea that God's equipped you to handle it and you'll never know it till you get in the pit. Why do you think God allows you to go through a pit? Sometimes it's so that you'll depend on Him more. Sometimes it's to show you you're stronger than you'd ever thought you were. And sometimes it's because somebody else is watching your life and they're wanting to see if what you have is real. But there are elements to your pit. And the conditions may not and usually are not pleasant when you're in a pit. Hmm? Can I say this? Your pit not only has elements, it has an enemy. There was a line in that pit. You have an enemy. He wants to destroy you. And what greater place to destroy you while you're in the pits? What was it, Irma Brombach or whatever name was, wrote that book, If Life's a Bowl of Cherry, Why Are We Always in the Pits? Hmm? What can I say? When you're in the pit, you're prime candidate for the enemy to destroy you. You have an enemy. So if you end up in a pit, you need to start looking around and saying, where's the enemy? Hmm? Where's the enemy, and what is he trying to do to destroy me while I'm in this pit? Hmm? Sometimes he puts thoughts in your head to quit, give up. Sometimes he roars real loud and scares you to death. Sometimes he just aggravates you and needles you to no end. Hmm? But make no mistake, he's there. He's wanting to rob, thief coming up, but for to steal, kill, or destroy you in your pit. Your pit will have elements. It'll have the enemy. But praise God, your pit will have an ending. Hmm? You are coming out of the pit. Either by the grave or in the air, one of these days we're getting out of this whole world. Are you listening? But your pit does have an exit. Now listen, you'll come out of that pit triumphantly, you'll come out of it in tears, or you'll come out of it with your tail tucked because you failed. But you're coming out of the pit. Hmm? Now listen, sooner or later, you're coming out. Now would to God we all come out triumphantly. Would to God we come out with a testimony, God help me in my discouragement, in my pit, in my lowest state. He came to where I was uh, and he got me out of the pit. Uh, that ought to be our prayer, that ought to be our desire, that ought to be our actions to come out of the pit unscathed uh, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen. Now you may come out in tears because... You're ashamed you didn't handle the pit the way you should. You may come out in tears because you're broken. You got broken in your pit. And I'm not talking about the kind of brokenness that God shows up because you're humbled. I'm talking about the kind of brokenness that it broke your everlasting testimony before God. And some people come out with their tails tucked because they utterly disgraced God while they were in their pit said things, acted in ways, did things that brought shame to the Lord in their pit. Hmm? Now listen, I know one thing about tests and trials. When you take a test in school and you don't pass it, you've got to take it over again. You don't get to pass on until you pass the test. Can I say when the Lord puts you through a test, you don't get to mature and go on. You're going to have to go through that again somewhere down the road. But let me say this. How, how are we going to come out of this pit triumphantly? How are we going to not allow our pit to become a pitfall? Well, can I say, first of all, it's going to take faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. It's going to take faith while you're in your pit that God hasn't forsaken you he knows where you are, and He's going to deliver you. Hmm? It's going to take faith. 
When Benet is in a pit with a lion on a snowy day, that's all he had. The only thing he could do was look up. And when you're in a pit with an enemy and the elements are against you, I highly recommend look up and trust in Jesus. Hmm? Put your faith in Him. He knew that pit was coming your way. Did he not tell Peter that Satan had desired to sift him as wheat? He knew even uh, 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 when you stepped off the patio and hurt your ankle or whatever. He knows what is going to befall you, my dear friends. So you just need to trust him. Hmm? Whether it's a pictorial pit, a physical pit, or a practical pit, you need to trust God. Hmm? Have faith. Faith will get you out of the pit. Hmm? Listen, if you didn't read this morning's devotions by Brother Jordan, I highly recommend that devotion. That was about as good as you're ever going to read. Sometimes what causes us to fail is fear. And perfect love casteth out all fear. And when your love for God causes you to put your faith in God rather than fear, you'll get out of the pit. Hmm? Matter of fact, can I help you with something? If you truly got faith in Him and you love Him right, it don't matter even if you get out of the pit. You're going to have a time in the pit. I believe Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had a time down there in the furnace because the fourth man was with them. Are you listening? Uh, they told that old wicked king, hey, hey God's going to deliver us, but if, even if He doesn't, we're not going to bow down to you. Huh? So what happened? He showed up right in the midst of their fire. I want to tell you, when you've got your faith in the Lord and your love for the Lord is right, are you listening? Oh, even in the pit you'll have a time because he's going to show up. Hmm? Where, what better place to be than where, where the Lord is? Whether it's in the pit, whether it's uh, 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 in a palace, it doesn't matter. Wherever God's at, Amen. you ought to have time. Yeah. Faith will get you out of your pit. Hmm? Can I say something else to get you out of your pit? The way out takes a foundation. Benaiah didn't learn to fight in the pit. He was well equipped before he faced the pit. If you don't have a foundation, you're never going to pass any trial. Hmm? If you don't have a foundation based in the Scriptures and based in walking with God based in meditating on God, based in already practicing putting your faith in God, when you hit a pit, you're going to fail miserably. Hmm? It amazes me how many people are easily led astray. You know why? You don't have a foundation. Hmm? Do you know why there are some people that regardless of what they face, they are steadfast and true? Because they're anchored into the rock. They have a foundation. They have learned that this Bible is more than just words and it's more than just stories. It's truth and it will set you free. They have totally bought in and put their faith in what God says. They have built up their faith in the truths of this book. They have put into practice the truths of this book. And when it comes time for trials, they rely on what they know, this book. Hmm? Why do you think they put soldiers through boot camp and they break them down and build them back up so that when they get in the battle, they don't crack under the pressure because they have got a foundation that will cause them to stand the line and do what they're supposed to do. Are we not to be Christian soldiers? Paul said, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. How are we not going to crack under the pressure by having a foundation? based on truth hmm? you need a foundation if you're going to get out of your pit hmm? Benaiah wasn't there wringing his hands wondering if God was going to show up he'd already been walking with God all his life and he was equipped to take on that line and he did can I help you something you're equipped to take on things too but you never launch out in faith so you never ever accomplish anything and when you get in your pit you fall apart because you haven't put into practice those things God's put in you. Why do you think that Paul said, work out your own salvation? Now the charismatics teach you've got to work to be saved. That's not what Paul's saying. He says, work out your own salvation. What God has put in you, work it out. Put it into practice. 
Start doing what God tells you to do and start acting on the faith and acting on the Word and you'll get stronger and stronger and stronger. Those guys that are muscle builders, muscle bound and work out with weights all the time, they don't get that by just looking in the mirror. They've got to lift those weights. And they lift it, tear those muscles, let them heal, lift it, tear those muscles, let them heal, and they do that and do that and do that till they become, you know, steroid freaks or whatever they look like, huh? They look like they, they got Volkswagens on, on, their, on their necks, you know? Why? Because they work out. Why are so many Christians weak today? Because you don't work. You don't work out what God's put in you. He's given you a measure of faith. It's up to you and I to increase that faith through the Word of God. Put it into practice. Hmm? You know why some people miserably fail, Brother Tommy? Because when they're in the valley, they don't look around and find the lily of the valleys. They just sit out and they have a breakdown and start crying and say, God hates me. No, He's loved you with an everlasting love. You just haven't put into practice what God's already told you to do. You've got to have a foundation. Hmm? Now, this is our 15th year in this building. And about this time of year, it shifts. And then in the spring, it'll shift again. And that's why Brother Ray's all the time patching cracks. It's funny. At certain times of the year, my bathroom door in my office, it just automatically opens. The other times, you've got to physically open it because the building shifts. But you know what keeps the walls up and the roof up and all the iron up? It's got a good foundation. Yeah. Amen. Hmm? Amen. You know what will keep you up in the midst of your pit? Keep your head looking up, keep your faith up, keep you stirred up. A good foundation. Amen. Hmm? You got a bad foundation, you're going to crumble. That's why in the parable of the sower, some when it begins to take root, and the heat gets on, can't endure the hardness, it withers away. Some's choked out by the world. They, they don't have any good roots, any foundation. Good seed on good soil brings forth good fruit. What can I say? If you don't let the Word of God take root in your life, you're never going to amount to anything for Christ. Hmm? Why do you think we preach so hard on being faithful? Why do you think it's important to have a steady diet, not just Sunday school, Sunday morning worship, Sunday evening worship, Wednesday evening worship, but every day of your life having a steady diet of the Word of God because you're going to face a pit. And you better have something in you in order to overcome. Well, I spent a whole lot more time on that than I wanted to. But the way out of your pit takes faith. It takes a foundation. But then you're going to have to face your pit. So many times when people land in a pit, they scream and cry and waller and try to, try to get away from their pit. If God allowed it to come into your life, He has a reason for that. But the only way you're going to come out of it is to face it. You can't sweep your pit under the carpet and expect it to go away and hope it to go away or wish for it to go away and it go away. That doesn't happen that way. Brother Ray, you remember when you was in the old building I was talking about sweeping something under your carpet I made you come lay down the floor I put a rug over you? Yeah, I did. Had a rug right over him. You could still see he was there. And you can try and sweep it under the carpet all you want to, but unless you face your pit, you're not going to get out of your pit. Why do you think so many... Folks, you, watch, you see it a lot on TV, and you see it if you watch the real Dr. Phil, not Dr. Phil Shibago, and you listen to people, and you walk, watch people, you read things. So many people harbor up hard feelings, maybe against their parents or against a loved one or somebody did something on, on the job. Or something. And why do you think they always tell them you've got to learn to forgive them? Amen. Say, well, they never ask for forgiveness. This isn't about them. It's about you. And if you don't forgive them, you are never getting out of your pit. Amen. Brother Greg said it a million times from behind this pulpit. He who angers you controls you. Right. Until you really learn to forgive and face that thing, you're never getting over it. Amen. And can I say, you've got to face 
your pit by confronting your pit. He faced the line in the pit regardless of the elements. Preached a message one time out of the same text on chasing your lions. Sometimes you've got to confront whatever it is that is trying to destroy you. Hmm? You just got to hit it head on. Can I say you not only face it through confrontation, you face it through commitment. Benaiah was going to whip that lion or die in that pit. It amazes me how many people, when they face a little adversity, the first thing they do is they quit on God. You're never getting out of your pit. You're never going to become a better Christian if you quit every time you face adversity. You've got to be committed. Whether it's sunshine or whether it's storm clouds, I'm going to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Joshua said, as for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. Hmm? You've just got to make up your mind, whether I'm in the pit or whether I'm on the mountaintop, I'm going to be true to Jesus. Hmm? You've got to be committed. You're never getting out of your pit if you're not committed to the things of God. Because the only thing that's really going to get you out of the pit is God. And when you're not concerned about Him, He's not concerned about you. You can sit there in the pit all day long. Sure. Hmm? Can I say this? Not only confrontation and commitment, but it's going to take conquering your pit. You've got to conquer it. Hmm? God designed it for you. He's given you everything you need to overcome it, but you've got to conquer it. Who slew the line? God? No. Benaiah. You've got to conquer your pit. Now, how am I going to conquer this pit, Brother Doug? I don't even know how I got in it. I don't even know what I'm faced with. How am I going to conquer? These elements are too big for me, Brother Doug. How am I going to conquer this pit? I'm glad you asked. You may have to pray your way out of it. Amen. David said in Psalms 40, verse 1, I waited patiently for the Lord, and He inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my goings. Uh, and he put a new song on my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it in fear, and shall trust in the Lord. David said, the Lord heard my cry, and he got me out of a horrible pit. And can I say, sometimes you're just going to have to pray your way out of a pit. And can I say, that little, now I lay me down to sleep prayer isn't going to do it. You're going to have to grab the horns of the altar and stay there till God delivers you out of your pit. Can I say? You may have to praise your way out of your pit. Isaiah 61 and 3, To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, folks that were in a pit, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, not daybreak mourning, mourning as in grieving, hmm? the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that He might be glorified. You may have to praise your way out of a pit. Even when you don't feel like praising Him, He's still worthy of your praise. Uh, 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 you might just need to just start bragging on Him. Tell Him how great He is, how thankful you are, how wonderful He is. Thank Him for saving you, thanking Him for being so good to you. And start praising the Lord, blessing the Lord, giving the Lord the glory to His name. And before you know it, you'll be out of your pit. Hmm? Amen. Because he's giving you a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Hmm? Can I say this? Sometimes we have to have it preached out of us. Sometimes we get in a pit and we don't know which way to turn. And God gives the preacher a message that helps us get out of our pit. Sometimes he needs to preach us out of a pit. Hmm? Been sometimes I've come into church lowering a snake's belly and the preacher get up and have the, have the touch of God on him and he just preached far out of me and then I'm ready to go out and face another battle. Are you listening? Sometimes preaching will get you out of your pit. Hmm? That's why we need preaching. Yes, sir. That's why we preach the whole counsel word. Sometimes we're getting rebuked. We're getting told how sorry no good we are. Yep. And sometimes we need to be told that. And then sometimes uh, uh, we're getting a message like tonight that'll help us, to just kind of help us. And you might not be in a pit tonight, but you better store it up because there's a pit coming your way. And you just might need one like this. And sometimes he gives us one that gives us a little glory hallelujah and we get to run around the, uh, the building thanking God we're going to heaven. Uh, uh, but listen, when we preach the Bible, it is intended for us to put into practice. And sometimes it's about preaching us out of our pit. Because there's a lot of folks that drag into church but they leave out skipping. Why? They got out of their pit. Hmm? Then I thought about this. 
Sometimes you just got to pull yourself out of the pit. Hmm. If the pit is a pit of your own making, God didn't design the pit for you. You did it yourself. You put yourself there, you're going to have to get yourself out. You say, Brother Doug, that's cruel. Let me give you a perfect biblical illustration. Y'all remember when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead? You remember the story. He waited four days. They came and told him, Lazarus is sick, sick unto death. He waited four days before he went. Hmm? Uh, the disciples were confused. They said, Our friend Lazarus, he's sick. He said, He just, this is all going to be done for the glory of God. Then Jesus shows up. Martha confronts him, kind of chews him out. Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Well, then Mary's bawling. She's, she's broken. She says the same things, but in a different spirit. She said, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. She's, she's, she's talking in faith. Martha's talking in scorn. Well, Jesus looks at Mary crying. He looks at the other crowd around there crying, and he begins to weep. John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. Now, that blows my mind, Miss Renee. He knows he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead. He said he's going to do this for the glory of God. But he's so concerned about them being brokenhearted, he becomes brokenhearted. What a Savior, huh? Yeah. Matter of fact, that crowd said, oh, how he loved them. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. But he gets down and he says, where have you laid him? They take him over to their tomb. And they would put a stone over the tomb. Jesus didn't put the stone over the tomb. So he told them to remove the stone. Martha again, no faith. Lord, he stinketh by now. Hmm? He said, I tell you, believe I'm the resurrection life. Right. Then he crawled, Lazarus come forth. Now you you got to understand, back then, a tomb, there might have been 25, 30 bodies in there. If he had just said, come forth, they'd all came out, Brother Donald. But he called him by name. Lazarus, come forth. Came out in the grave clothes. He said, loose him, let him go. Two things in that story for a biblical illustration. Jesus didn't put the stone over the tomb, so he made them remove it before he did a work. Jesus didn't put the grave clothes on him, and Jesus didn't take them off. He said, loose him and let him go. There are some things that we have done ourselves that have caused us to be in a pit, and God's not going to deliver us until we put the first foot forward. That's good. Amen. Sometimes you're going to have to pull yourself out of the pit. You put yourself there. See, this is the way it works. God expects us to do what we can, then He does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Yeah, hmm? There are some things we can't do. We can't control the elements. No. But there are some things we can do. And He expects us to do what we can, then He helps us in the things we can't do. But sometimes you just got to pull yourself out of the pit. Sometimes you got to realize, hey, I'm here by my own making. God didn't have anything to do with this. Uh, I'm sick of this. Uh, and God, uh, if you help me, I'm getting up out of here. And uh, hey, that prodigal son, uh, uh, he said uh, he came to himself. Uh, he said, I will arise and go to my father's house. Uh, he got up, uh, went back the same path he left on. Uh, and what happened? Uh, when he got down there, the father ran, met him, fell on him, and kissed him. Uh, hey, God did for him what he couldn't do for himself when he got out of the hog pit. Pen, friends, uh, and sometimes you got to get out of your hog pens, get out of your pit, and start heading for what's right, and God will meet you in the middle. Are you listening? Hmm? So I've said all that to say this: you may be in a pit for the week weekend, but don't let your pit become a pitfall. There's too many statistics of people that end up in a pit, and their life's destroyed for Christ. They become a detriment to the cause of Christ. Don't let your pit become a pitfall. Hey, it's okay to end up in a pit. One of the greatest warriors in Israel is in a pit. It's okay to end up in a pit. Just don't let it ruin your life. Don't let it, let it ruin your love for God. Don't let it destroy you. Let it define you. Everybody can say, yeah, remember when they went in a the pit? Yeah, but look what God did. Well, they's in the pit. Are you listening? Don't let your pit become a pitfall. No matter what you're facing, God's bigger than your pit, and you are too close to God and too good for God to end up in a pitfall. Are you listening? God needs you.
he didn't need you, he'd take you on to heaven. Mm -mm. If he didn't have something for you to do, you'd already be in glory. You do know that, don't you? So God's choosing to use you, so let him use you by not getting shipwrecked and come pitfall. Yeah, you might end up in a pit. It's okay. Be in good company. Benaiah was in a pit. Hmm? A lot of other good godly people. Jeremiah ended up in a pit. Hmm? Paul was in a prison that was like a pit. So was Peter. Are you listening? God didn't forsake them, and he won't forsake you when you're in your pit. Just turn to him. Don't let your pit be a pitfall. Let's all stand, Brother Clint. Come, get a song of invitation. Father Kevin, let's pray. Father, we sure do love you. Lord, I hate that anybody has to face a pit. I hate that anybody has troublesome days and troublesome times. Lord, I know we face pits because Adam and Eve sinned and that cursed this old world and, Lord, these old bodies of flesh, they just face things. Well, Lord, I'm glad we never face a pit alone. So God, help us do like that song, Brother James saying, not to worry, not to fret, just to trust in you. Lord, help us do like that song Miss Noreen sang. No, no matter where we end up, you've already been there. And you're able to deliver us from it. Help us to take this pictorial truth and this practical truth, or, or physical truth, and apply it as practical truths that we can overcome the flesh, the world, and the devil, and any pit that gets in our way by keeping our eyes on you. And Lord, I don't know anybody's heart. Lord, I don't know what folks are facing. But Lord, I pray you'd help your people. If somebody's in a pit, I pray you'd deliver them even tonight. Lord, I pray if folks uh, find themselves in a pit in the days to come, Lord, they'd remember this message and they'd turn to you. Lord, I pray you'd def- help them to defeat any enemy and conquer any foe while they're in their pit that you would get glory and honor. Help us, Lord, to not allow our pits to defeat us, but to define us for the honor and glory of God. Bless now this invitation. We'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.